Good morning, everyone. For Telesur, I'm Cody Weddle in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin in Brazil, where the country's final round of presidential elections are just a few days away. Up to 140 million voters will be eligible to vote on Sunday to decide which candidate will lead Latin America's largest country. A new poll released on Wednesday shows that incumbent President Dilma Rousseff continues to lead the race. The survey gives Rousseff 52 percent support compared with 48 percent of intended support for Aisha Neves. It marks the fourth poll published in three days that puts Rousseff ahead of her business-friendly rival. It also shows a 3 percent growth in Rousseff's numbers since last week. And the distinct economic visions of the two candidates means the elections re election results will have profound impacts on the country's development model. Our co special correspondent Stephanie Kennedy reports on the potential economic and political consequences of these elections. Now, in these presidential elections here in Brazil for the year 2014, Brazilians are being presented with two different economic choices. There is the project of Aécio Neves, which is a return to neoliberalism. Now, the last, the last time Brazil had a neoliberal government was in the 1990s, and during that period, unemployment rose, as did extreme poverty and the marginalization of the working class. Since the Workers' Party came into power, extreme poverty has been reduced and the middle class has grown, turning in Brazil into the seventh largest economy in the world. Now, projects of rejuvenation, such as the rebuilding of the Rio Harbor, as we see behind us, is just another example of how this emergent economy here in Latin America continues to grow. Brazil keeps on digging, building and expanding. And while sectors on the right argue the economy is stagnating, others are keen to bust the myth of a country in collapse. Carlos Bastos is one of them, who we met up with at Rio's Federal University. Real wages continue to grow. The rate of unemployment is very low, historically low, and more jobs are created than lost. If Bastos warns that if candidate Aécio Neves were to become president, important social and economic gains achieved over the past 12 years would be gradually faded out. It would lead to a fiscal adjustment and a more intense reduction in public spending. These kinds of policies will result in a rise of unemployment and a loss of jobs without strip workers of their power. Bastos also considered the consequences of closer relations with the United States, as proposed by the opposition in Brazil. It would lead to a fiscal adjustment and a more intense reduction in public spending. These kinds of policies will result in a rise of unemployment, and a loss of jobs would strip workers of their power. Under both Lula da Silva and Dilma Rousseff, Brazil played a leading role in blocs such as Mercosur and BRICS. Such is its power today that in 2016 it will be hosting the World Summer Olympics. Stephanie Kennedy, Telesur, Rio. And thanks to Stephanie, Uruguayans will also take to the polls on Sunday. Polls there show the left-wing candidate has at least a 10-point lead, but that the race will likely enter a second-round runoff. In recent surveys, broad-front candidate Tabaré Vázquez is falling short of the 50 percent of the votes and needed to avoid a runoff. According to Uruguayan election law, if no candidate obtains a majority of the votes, the race enters a second-round runoff on November 30th between the two leading candidates. Over 2 million Uruguayans will be eligible to vote Sunday. The Mexican government has announced it will offer a reward of $100,000 for information on the whereabouts of 43 missing students. The announcement comes as the Mexican authorities have stepped up efforts to find the students almost a month since they were reported missing. It comes amid mounting national pressure for action. The case has put a spotlight on ties between the Mexican political class, the police, corruption and gang violence. Another nationwide day of protest is scheduled for today. And in Colombia, the Constitutional Court has authorized a law requiring a general referendum for any peace agreements achieved in ongoing talks between the government and FARC guerrilla group. 
The referendum would be held in parallel to Colombia's local authorities' elections. The decision comes as the peace talks enter their second year. So far, the government and the guerrillas have reached agreements in areas such as political integration of former combatants and a solution to drug trafficking. On Wednesday, the World Health Organization announced it hopes to come up with a vaccine against Ebola by January 2015. Trials for the vaccine are already underway. Meanwhile, Cuba announced a second group of doctors and health workers left the country Tuesday to travel to West Africa to help fight the Ebola virus. 58 of the workers will be stationed in Liberia and the rest will, will head to Guinea. The group will join another 165 Cuban health workers already deployed to West Africa. We go to the Middle East where the United States continues airstrikes operations against the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. The Pentagon revealed Tuesday that since August it has spent $424 million fighting the Islamic State. That's nearly $8 million per day. Meanwhile, a senior U.S. official has revealed that the Iraqi government is requesting more U.S. advisors. The U.S. Mil military is considering the request. Fear of mission creep has deepened following Australia and announcing plans to deploy more special forces. In Syria, as the battle rages for the town of Kobani, some Kurdish organizations claim that the Islamic State group has used chemical weapons. Journalists on the ground say doctors lack the equipment necessary to confirm the claim. Some patients have experienced trouble breathing, burn marks, and other symptoms that could be related to chemical reaction. Iraq and Syria held significant chemical weapons, which some fear could have ended up in Islamic State hands. The Pentagon apparently acknowledges that a U.S. airdrop of weapons over Kobani may have ended up in the hands of the Islamic State. A video released by the terrorist group shows a militant going through boxes of grenades and military equipment attached to a parachute in the middle of a deserted area. The U.N. says it will launch an investigation into attacks on its facilities during Israel's recent war in the Gaza Strip. The international body says tens of thousands of homes were damaged or destroyed in 50 days of fighting and over 10,000 people were left homeless. Many took shelter in U.N. buildings, which were then also attacked. In one incident, more than a dozen people were killed at a U.N. school. Nothing could have prepared me for what I witnessed in Gaza. I saw mile after mile of wholesale destruction. I visited a United Nations school in the Jabalia refugee camp, which was shelled during the hostilities. Civilians had sought protection under the UN flag. And we end this morning with a look at the backlash to the sentence handed down to Paralympic athlete Oscar Pistorius for the killing of his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp. Now, as we reported yesterday, Pistorius was sentenced to five years for culpable manslaughter of Steenkamp. However, it has since come to light that he may serve as little as 10 months in jail and the remaining part of his sentence under house arrest. While Steenkamp's family say they believe that justice has been served, protesters in South Africa have, uh, have gathered around and condemned the sentence as too lenient. On social media, the no justice hashtag has been trending. Some women's rights groups say the sentence sends all the wrong messages. Okay. Plenty more on those stories and others at our website, telesertv.net slash English for Telesert English. I'm Cody Weddle. Hope you have a great day.